بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وله. So we're looking at fatawa, Islamic legal rulings that will solve problems in our lives and will create a clarity from the actual reference of Islamic law, from the scriptural references and from the interpretations that the various schools of thought um, have given. And as we talked about before, we have all of these schools of thought. You're, you're familiar with four of them, but when you study ifta, there are over 90, 90 samad schools of thought. Al-Awza'i, wa thawri wa Ibn Hazm, wa Abu Dawood. You have many scholars in our history who didn't have dedicated students on a marketing campaign to get everybody to follow their teacher. But yet they had teachers who were like Abu Hanifa and Shafi and Malik and ha those guys are not angels and they are not prophets. Okay, they're great scholars and we have many of those. Just because someone is famous does not mean that they are the best scholar. Just because someone is known to be pious does not mean they're the most pious person that ever walked this earth after prophets, right? And so this is where we have to be careful of idolizing people and feeling like my identity is connected to a teaching of an opinion, of an interpretation of a human being who is as a human being in terms of Sharia, the same as you and I, right? Now, when we look at this issue today, I see lots of problems coming from it. And so I'm trying to solve it here, inshallah. And that is, Al-Masah ala al-Jawrabayn wal-Khuffayn wal-Na'layn wal okay? Wiping over the shoes, the socks, and whatever. Right? We have literally dozens of hadith that the Prophet ﷺ clearly preferred and most often would wipe over and not wash his actual foot. So now just keep that in mind for a moment now. The Prophet's most common practice throughout his life by reading was after he made his wudu first, he would put on a sock and then he would wipe over it most of the time, right? And that was to make things easy, as all scholars would agree in general. Now the problem came is that in the early generation, Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik started the strict uh, policies that were cut and pasted throughout history. And the majority position follows their attitude, which is, identifying the issue through type of sock rather than point of ruling. So they're saying the reason the Prophet did this because he had a very thick sock, a type of sock you could walk around in in the day and it would not tear up. And so then as long as the sock is like that, you can wipe over, which now means in modern context, pretty much it's going to be very difficult to do that, which is why most all of you are in there taking off and all the water and everything and it flip-flops and not flip-flops and the whole thing becomes very complicated. You see what I'm saying? Now, there are uh, a litany of other scholars who did not see that point. And they said that the issue, the basis for the ruling is not the type of sock, it is to make things easy as long as your foot is covered. If your foot, whatever you would need to be making will do over, if that place is fully covered, then that is the point of why this ruling exists, not necessarily what type of sock. And so they are saying that the ruling is related uh, to the um, per permission, the, the facilitation of, of, the, of the religion. So this point gets hammered in in the fact that it is authentically narrated that the Prophet ﷺ did wipe over Jawrabayhi wa Na'alayhi. So he would wear some wool socks and then he would have like a sandal with a very thick leather bottom and then a wraparound leather thing on top of it. That was a common um, thing that people wore back then. You wouldn't use that if you're traveling on a long journey, which the Prophet ﷺ used to travel on long journeys. Very commonly, you find yourself in a war. So the khuf, the very thick leather sock, is about long journeys in the desert and being ready to fight a war. You have to think about context. That makes it so easy to understand your religion. Why were they doing this thing? Is it because there's holy socks? 
Do we have holy, sacred wudu socks? Let's people talk about it like that. The wudu sock. No. The point was <laughs> that these people were preparing for battles and going on long journeys, not in cars where you just sit in the car, but you're on the camel, getting on, getting off, going here, traveling. How do you use the bathroom back then? You just open the door for the bathroom, or you have to go all the way over the hill, far away, because there's no such thing as plumbing. Pay attention to the context, why these things exist. So, Ibn al-Munthir, he also makes the point that Um Salama, there's an authentic hadith that she masahat ala al-hijab. And the Prophet ﷺ masaha ala al-imama. And, which is the turban. Some scholars said, well, this Um Salama on the hijab, we're interpreting that she moved it enough so that some hair could be touched. Is that mentioned in the hadith? No. But they're just trying to make things difficult, it looks like to me, from my perspective. It's like, if it doesn't say that in the hadith, why are you assuming that? Well, because we know you have to wipe. The, but this, this masah is a thing, you see, right? مَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجٍ We said in the beginning, there's literally 20, 30 texts in the Qur'an and Sunnah in which Allah is saying He wants to make things easy for you. He doesn't want to make religion some nitpicky religious hardship. That is the way of Bani Israel that got them in all of the problems, Surah Al-Baqarah. That's why it's called Surah Al-Baqarah. What kind of cow, how many cows, what, at what age, what color, all that thing. We get into this nitpickiness and we lose the point. And Allah is making things easy on us. So Ibn al-Mundhir he brings also, uh, Ibn al-Mundhir is a hadith scholar, but he was very adamant about the point that I'm making to you. He's well known. Ibn al-Mundhir, mashallah, one of the great scholars of our history. He said, إِبَاحَةُ الْمَسْحَ عَلَى الْجَوْرَبَيْنِ مِنْ صُوفِ عَنْ تِسْعَةِ صَحَابَ عَلِي بْنَ أَبِي طَالِبْ Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Abdullah ibn Umar, Anas ibn Malik, Ammar ibn Yasir, Bilal, Barra ibn Azib, wa Abi Umama, wa Sahl ibn Sa'ad. He named nine companions that said, that we see nothing wrong and it is our general practice that you can make uh, wiping over a wool sock. Wool. So it's not leather, it's not, if you put water, you, if you walk around, it will tear up. And so he's bringing nine companions to make that point. Why is he doing that? Even, how many of you are familiar with Shaykh al-Albani? Yeah, on this issue he makes the same point. He's saying, I don't know why the ulama cut and paste their previous mashayikh and said, oh, it has to be thick sock and it has to be this and that. It's the point is to make it easy. If your foot's covered, you wipe over it and now it makes your, your wudu easy. You save water and you save time, right? And you go play, pray. That's what Allah is trying to do with this entire ruling. Not a special sacred sock that has special qualities that you would never wear because then your foot would get very sweaty. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> As I, again, why were they wearing that? So then the discussion came up, is it better in general to take off and wash? So, oh, I'm mu'min, I'm doing the full wudu as Allah mentioned in the Qur'an. But in the same what Allah mentioned in the Qur'an, He talked about what if you don't have water? And He talked about tayammum and then He said what? لِيَجْعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ Ah, he wants to make it easy on you. He does it. That's in the same context that if things became difficult for you, he wants to make them easy for you. So the scholars, they brought uh, the Hanbali school of thought and some of the Shafi'is are in agreement that it is better to follow the permission. Because why? The Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى يُحِبُّ أَنْ تُؤْتَى رُخُصُهُ كَمَا يَكْرَهُ and ta ma'asiyatuhu that Allah loves that you would take his permissions just like he would love that you would or that he would dislike that you would go to his dis, uh, his, uh, his uh, disobedience to go against him right so if he's giving you a permission Allah is saying here you can do this it'll make it easier for you for you to be like no I'm a very strict person right which is the mentality somehow people got it in their mind that religious means strict Right? But the Prophet ﷺ, according to Aisha, مَا أَخْتَارَ النَّبِي بَيْنَ أَمْرَيْنِ إِلَّا أَخَذَ بِأَيْسَرِهِمَا Anytime the Prophet ﷺ was faced with two options, he always took the easier of the two. مَا لَمْ يُكُنْ فِيهِ إِثْمِ As long as there was no sin in it. Okay? So, um, the Prophet ﷺ, now, we get to the second point. Imam al-Bayhaqi, in his sunan, he brings what we call athar, meaning, these are like hadith, but they don't go to the Prophet. They are about the behaviors of the companions and the attitudes of the companions. 
So people now are in there and they believe I wipe over my sock, no problem. I'm good with that. But I have to take off my shoe first. Because if I wipe over my shoe and I take it off and I pray in my sock, then I have to, I didn't wipe over my sock. The whole point is that your foot was covered and it got wiped over. Whether you had three layers of coverings and you took off two of them, it's still covered. You see the point? It's not that you actually washed it, which is why Ali ibn Abi Talib said, if it was all about logic like you're trying to do here, then it would be wiping over what? The bottom. But it's simply a facilitation, like this. It's just a symbolic recognition. One time, just a symbolic thing, right? And so the scholars differed. Those that said, no problem, as long as you, the whole part is there. And so they said, if your shoe does not cover the, the entire place of wudu, which most shoes do not, unless you're a basketball player, mashallah, okay, um, then you need to finish your wipe up on the sock. Other scholars said, it makes really no difference. You're just wiping over. It's not that big of a deal. But they go back to this uh, athar, uh, Imam Bayhaqi. رَأَيْتُ عَلِي إِبْنْ أَبِي طَالِبْ مَسَحَ عَلَى نَعْلَيْهِ وَجَوْرَبَيْهِ ثُمَّ أُقِيمَتُ الصَّلَى فَخَلَعَ نَعْلَيْهِ ثُمَّ تَقَدَّمَ فَأَمَّ النَّاسِ فِي الصلاة. So Ali is the Khalifa. Okay? And this uh, Tabi'i is saying, I saw Ali, that he made wudu, and he had some socks and some uh, sandals on. And he wiped over the socks and the sandals, and then he took his sandals off, and he went in there with his socks still on, and led the people in the salah. Okay? This is the point we're getting it from the text. All confirming all the points that we have been made is the understanding of the companion. The whole point of wudu is that we're not actually, for the vast majority of the time, washing any actual physical dirt off. You know, it's a mental and spiritual preparation knowing that we are sinners. And as the Prophet ﷺ said, that مَنْ تَوَضَّى فَحْسَنَ الْوُضُوءِ خَرَجَتْ خَطَايَاهُ مِنْ تَحْتِ أَلْفَارِهِ That whenever somebody makes wudu and they perfect it, their sins are coming out underneath their nails as the water drops off. Meaning what? It's a spiritual practice that has spiritual uh, implications. It is not an actual washing, right? Out at your extremities. My hands, maybe I pointed somebody and talk, thought about him in a certain way or something like that. Maybe, maybe I, you know, physically hurt somebody or something, may God forbid. Or maybe I looked at the wrong thing, I'm washing. Maybe I said the wrong thing, I'm washing out here. Maybe I was thinking about the wrong thing, right? Maybe I walked towards sin, right? You see? So the sins you're committing come with these places you're making wudu. So you are washing those places that you know you're a sinner with. Um, in order to prepare to stand in front of Allah Yeah, so we said, has to cover the place of wudu. So you have your ankle. It has to, so those socks that they have for like runners and stuff that go under the ankle, this will not suffice. Right? It has to cover the place of, which like for me, like for the summer, I get the one, they have a mid one. There's the long one like this that goes like that, and then they have the one that like just goes above that one. But you have to cover the whole spot, number one. But the thing about, is it too thin, like, you know, from your dress, uh, like your, your suit, sometimes you get the very thin sock. As long as it's covering the foot and it's not like a, a hole there, right? So you're wearing sock, you're wearing shoe, okay? You wipe over the shoe and then you go pray in the shoe. But if you took the shoe off but the foot is completely covered in the place of wudu, it makes no difference that you took the shoe off. You don't have to take the shoe off and then wipe on the sock and then put the shoe back on, come back here, take the shoe off. All of that process is making it difficult again, which is against the whole point. You're making things difficult for yourself. Ali ibn Abi Talib, his, his action is, is well established in the authentic athar uh, for us. Anybody else uh, with a question? But this, is what, this is what they say about Umm Salama. So, so this is, this is uh, I think, has a legitimate point for the hijab, not for the amama, because the Prophet wiped over his amama. And, you know, we don't have, we don't have awrat al-sha'r, you know, we don't have that. Okay, so for, for the man, so it looks like the analogy should fit for everyone. So that's one approach. But some put it that when, uh, when the women were making wudu in their home, in the, you know, privacy, they would take it off. But Umm Salama was making wudu in a public situation, and so she wiped over her. So it's definitely valid, you know, for any woman to wipe over. Bye, inshallah. Zakum la khairan, hayakum Allah. Subhanak la bihamdik, shalom la ilaha, 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 shalom la ilaha